Steve, it's really great to have you. Uh, it's been a little bit since I saw you last. I think it was Evans's Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Yes, sir. And as a, a tarpon fisherman as we are, I think this is, for me, the most important interview uh, that we've done out of 80-some interviews. Um, and the fact that um, it's such a big spectrum, what we've done, tarpon fishing, Homosassa was the big game arena where most of the people gravitated to to catch world record fish. And for the people that are watching, if you ever want to read the big spectrum of tarpon fishing from day one to where it is today, Monty Burke's book, uh, Lords of the Fly, uh, it captivates you know all the players that were in the game all those years. Uh, and ultimately, you ended up catching the largest tarpon that has ever been caught on fly. Yes, sir. It was uh, an honor. Yeah, I mean, it was 202 pounds, 8 ounces. Correct, sir. And I must say, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the home assassin story in a minute. But what drives me crazy, and I'd like to have, you know, your, your take on this. When I see people post big fish around the world, maybe Gabon or maybe up in Apalachicola area with, uh, I love him. Right, right. Uh, but when Orvis posted the fish that he caught, and they said, this fish is so many pounds greater than the world record fish that's ever been caught. It drove me friggin' crazy because <laughs> when these people catch fish on 30 pound tests that are really big fish, comparing that fish caught uh, to your fish caught on 20 pound tests, it's like saying I own the course record uh, at Doral, but I didn't play by the rules I played from the white tee boxes. Yes, sir. And that's what gripes me more about the younger people that are tarping fishing and i'm not going to say all of them but there are so many out there today that don't play by the rules the igfa has their category two pound up to 20 pound and the tip it everything is it's just the rules you know we have rules in golf and tennis and everything else and when you when you step out of that boundary the uh it just doesn't count. Like they say, uh, like uh, Sandy Mret says, we can all shoot par if we don't play by the rules. <laughs> exactly. Um, but here I want everybody to understand that some people like Steve Huff and a few others think, maybe you too, that unless you're fishing IGFA compliant, International Game Fish Association appliant, you're not fly fishing. I agree 100%. See, and I disagree. Okay. Because like, Steve, like Rick Ruoff says, I got a fly rod. I got to fly reel. I got to fly line. I got to fly. How can that not be fly fishing? I understand where you're coming from. However, I was brought up with that specific set of rules. Mm -hmm. And, and I understand what you're saying. We're still fly fishing. We're doing, we're going through the motions, but I guess I'm too ingrained in the possibility of record fishing. Yeah. And I think too, that might be because of your history and the, your long life in home Sassa, where I think for the most part, most people were chasing records there. That's correct. I mean, there were not a lot of people just going fun fishing in home Sassa. No, a few, but not many. Right. However, I started out as an angler, like most everybody else did in home Sassa, and I took my beatings one after another after another, and I think I fished, I figured over a course of two years, I fished 32 or 33 days before I ever got one to the boat. I made every mistake possible. I had a cheap little scientific angler's reel and a Billy Brew, you know, massive 12 weight, 13 weight. And uh, it was a tough transition to learn how to fly fish. And then I said, I've got to spend more time out here. And at that point in time, I'd gone through a transition of corporate work to woodworking and started guiding, and I just didn't have time to go to work anymore. So that's when I got involved. And I learned more in two or three years after I became um, associated with Stu Apt. Right. He, he mentored me. I, I fished him just for fun because I wanted him here. A buddy of mine in Cortland hooked me up with him. And Stu basically took me by the hand and said, this is how you fish. This is what you throw at them. This is how you fight them. And, and of course, that goes back to the correct tippets. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the IGFA thing. So that's all I ever knew. Right. So when you're not on the tarpon grounds, when you're snook and red fishing, are you still fishing IGFA legal? If I'm fishing with fly rod, yes. So if someone comes up to the boat and he's a first time client and he has straight 30, you're cutting it all off and fishing IGFA legal? I would have in the past, but I do so little of that anymore. I pretty much target tarpon only. Right. And uh, the reason being is I'm semi retired. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, you talk about Hup and all that. He's retired, but he fishes all the time. Sure. But I have mm-hmm. other projects that I do and I work on. But the tarpon is my my game. It's my thing. Mm-hmm. And I love it. Let me uh, quote a couple of guys, good friends of yours. And when I called them and asked them about, about you, what kind of, what do you, what do you, how do you feel about Steve Kilpatrick and, and Al DePeric? You know, hey, Al, it's time to do a podcast with us, bro. Uh, We've been chasing him. <laughs> We've been chasing him down the rabbit hole for a couple of years now. But you know, he <laughs> Al DePeric was with Evans for all those years, and they caught those massive records. Oh yeah, uh, which was a uh, Tom and Al broke pace record, the one eighty eight that stood for twenty five years. Right, right. So they got one ninety one, and then he he they got they got a one ninety four on twelve pound test. Exactly. So those were the real big guns at the time. But anyway, I called Al. He says, Steve, Steve Kilpatrick is the best rigger I've ever seen rigging boats. Knots, leaders, tippets, all perfect. He's a very good fisherman with great instincts. His, he works hard and always, uh, and always wants to do what's good for the fishery. Super good guy, one of my best friends. Um, Evans, Steve is a really good guy. A redneck, but a really <laughs> good guy. Um, yeah. But the accolades go on and on. And, right. you know, now that we're here, we're going to talk about that big fish in a little bit. But um, tell me about what does it mean when we've all known the definition of the home assassin story? Right. You tell me in your words, what does the home assassin story mean to you? That's a tough question. For me but uh i'll do the best i can i came to homosassa and and i got in the game late you know the other guys had been there since i guess the 70s late 70s i got in there mid 80s and they all and like evans you know the poon's dead he's gone there's no he's not gonna ever be back blah 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 but to me when i first saw that fishery and the massive schools and tarpon everywhere on top all the way from black rock to the sand it just triggered at something in me that made me want to be there every day that the fish were possibly going to be there so even though i got into the game a little bit later than you know the, the guys that first developed it i still just love the place and still to this day um and I know it's never going to be like it was, but it's still the place I think you will catch the 200-pound fish, the 190, the whatever. And unfortunately, there's only two or three people even trying anymore. So I don't think, if in my opinion, I don't think these records are going to be broken. Yeah, they're so big, so massive. And, and, a lot, and two, there's not a lot of 190-some-pound fish swimming around, especially 200s. No. You know, I think every year Al and I and the other guys will see a few. But just because you see them doesn't mean you're going to catch them. And right. as, as I can think back years and years talking to Tom. He says it seems like about every 10 years we'll get a chance to hook one. you got to put your, your, your time in. Let's go back to 1970. This is a a quote from Al Fluger Jr., Okay, one of the great fishermen of all time. I am in the boat with Stu Apt. It's my first day there. Jim Brewer is in another boat. Eddie Whiteman, Eddie Whiteman is out there too. So, Bill, so is Bill Curtis. We haven't seen any fish. It's slick, calm, maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm standing on the bow looking over our gulf when I see them. It looks like rain shower hitting the water. Their fish are 200 yards away, rolling, coming at us. I'd never seen a population of tarpon like that and never will again. There were thousands and thousands and thousands as far as you can see. The first first fish came through uh, the boats as happy as you could be. Everyone was just standing there, mouths wide open. I took a cast and hooked one. 
I looked around and everyone started to grab their rods. <laughs> Another quote from Dale Perez, who also caught a big world record with Evans. There were thousands of fish, 500 in a school. They'd push a wake like you couldn't believe. You could see it from 600 yards away. I got so excited about the tarpon that I had to get my doctor to prescribe some <laughs> sleeping pills. <laughs> and the great Steve Huff. There were thousands and thousands of tarpon, 10,000 of them. I'm serious. Did you see that kind of a fishery? I, I have seen. Days. Days like that when I first started um, talking about, we'd call them Roland Henry's. You know, you just massive schools coming in, 500 fish, I don't know, a thousand black rock days. Daylight would happen. You wake up and it's like a National Geographic moment. There's just fish rolling as far as you can see. So, yeah, I've seen a portion of what those guys were talking about, mm -hmm. but nothing like tens of thousands. Right. Um, two here is um, I remember asking Billy Pate. I was in Home Assassin 88. I caught a fish with Bill Miller, Tommy Locke. Uh, um, what's Eddie's name? Little Eddie from Boca Grande. What am I thinking of? Eddie White? Eddie White. Ed no, 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 not no, Eddie White. Uh, Walker. Uh, Eddie, Walker. Eddie, Eddie Walker. Walker caught yeah. a big fish with Eddie Walker. Right, so right. I, I saw a little bit of it. Yeah. But I'd go for like five days and not see a fish. And I felt like I couldn't get better, so I went to the Keys. I was in 88. Yeah. So a lot of this stuff happened um, you know, just before I got there, and you started in 85. Right. Well, that's about when I started fishing. But then again, you have to think back to the days where the, the guys first went from the Black Rock, where, everybody, where the old timers fished, and they started following them down. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, who was it that brought Bill Curtis? It might have been Navarre or something. I'm not sure. But that's when he named it the Oklahoma Flat. They've been out there days and days and days. He said, this place reminds me of, oh. my, of my hometown in Oklahoma, a barren, desolate wasteland. And you say you've gone with four or five days. I've gone weeks and not seen them. And then it's like somebody flips a switch. Here they come. So, And there's no rhyme or reason when you see them when they come. I don't think so. You know, everybody says, well, it's got to be water temperature. It's got to be this. It's got to be that. I think the initial fish show up just like the, we talk about elk doing the rut. I think there's a light cycle, a number of hours in the day. And I think that tri triggers the first migration we get from offshore. But uh, I don't know. It's just so difficult. They might be in there in middle April. And that's when I'm talking about the first fish. And then we get the migration, usually late May, early June. They come up and they, you may find them in July. But there's always periods of lull. And Tom will tell you, Tom Evans will tell you, I mean, he's talked about his diary that he's kept. Mm -hmm. I mean, no fish, no fish. Went 20 days, saw two fish. So, I don't know. I, I wish I had an answer to why they come and why they don't. And it, I think back to Boca Grande, you know, everybody says, well, they've got the greatest maybe crab population. I don't know. Homosassa had a lot of crabs at one time, but I think it's water quality myself. Mm -hmm. um, in the old days, we had gazillions of gallons of water coming out of all these springs, Wikiwachi, Homosassa, Crystal River, all that. And that's dried up due to population. They put more wells in the ground, like water yards, all that. So I think the salinity has something to do with why there's not as many, but it's just like Boca Grande. That's probably one of the most difficult places for a tarpon to survive today because the sharks, right. they keep coming back. Mm -hmm. So are they smart, are they dumb, or is it just evolution? And then Homo is the somewhat same way. Some days we'll have them, some days we won't. Why they show up, Black Rock initially was a wonderful place to fish the past few years it's been we call it the no rock you know, they just don't stage there anymore like they did in the everglades in florida bay they've always said that the the, the biggest fish come in early spring february march april did you notice that in homosassa or they was it just kind of no random i will tell you that based on the years that i fished homosassa the giants come early 
and I think, I don't think, I know, just based on what I'm seeing, they come from offshore. They don't come from south to north. So there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. All of a sudden we have fish, and they're these big blackbacks, we call them. Late May, early June, we get the greenies. Those mm -hmm. fish are on, they're coming from the <coughs> south heading north. But our big fish come in from offshore, and they do. They usually hit the Black Rock area, and then they migrate down to the sand by Pine Island, and they go offshore, and they do a big loop. Then the migration that happens in late May, early June, those fish are coming straight up the coast. Hmm. But the giant fish, absolutely. Right. Now, now, I've seen huge fish in July. I mean, Gary Merriman, one of my best buddies, he was fishing with uh, one of the boys in the book, Bobby Era. And Bobby wanted to kill their fish at Chaz Point. And Bob, Bobby said, it's a monster. We need to kill it. Gary says, no, I'm not going to kill it. But point in fact, I've caught some 180, 90-pound fish in July. Not, I don't normally see very many, but you do catch them occasionally. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, let's go back a little bit. You said that. <clears throat> was Stu App guiding you just for fun in 85? Um, or was he uh, still guiding professionally at the time? I don't think Stu was guiding. Um, he used to guide in the Keys a long right, time ago. Right, a long time so ago. So that's probably after that. Yeah. What, what exactly was he teaching you that you might relate to, to the neophytes out there that are interested in getting you know, into tarpon fishing? What do you teach now? Um, well, first I'll go back to what I learned from Stu. He was probably one of the most anal people I've ever met about equipment. Everything was precisely measured. He had a system, tackle. He didn't touch his rod. You didn't mess with his tippet. You didn't touch his leaders. He taught, tied everything. That was, to me, something that I thought, this guy's dead serious. But more than that, Stu had a knack of, and I fished with him. I met him through a buddy of mine, Ed Arrington, that's passed away now through Cortland, he worked with Cortland, and that's how I got involved with Stu, and Stu at that time was working with Diamondback developing a rod. So we all sort of got into it, they brought him, we called them the diamond cracks, they blew up left and right, they were spigot ferrules. But when I witnessed, and, and I go back to my story, fishing 30 days, trying to figure out how to catch one of these things, and pulling and breaking stuff and tearing crap up, Stu's fishing, he never, I never saw him fish anything but 12 pound test. And the first time I saw him catch a fish, I was just blown away. He had the system, the down and dirty, and he told me the butt's made for fighting, the tip's made for casting. And he'd point that rod straight at him, pull on. His 12 weight rod sounded like it was gonna, you could just hear it moaning. And, but he'd catch that fish I mean, some big fish, 140, 150-pound fish, in six minutes, 10 minutes. He would, fish would eat, and he'd use very little drag. He'd let the fish take off, jump, 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 run, run, run. And when that fish stopped, that was it. He didn't let him go anymore. And that, I think once that fish spirit is broken, you have an opportunity to catch him then. But if you're thinking, I don't want to break him off, I'm going to be nice to him, and he gets, he recovers, he gets that second wind, then you're going to look out there and that tail's going like, and guess what that fish does his whole life? He swims for a living. And when he's doing that, and you've given up catching him, he's, it's going to be a long day for you. Better pack a lunch. Mm-hmm. What do you think of uh, Billy Pate and his abilities to catch fish? Well, I was around Billy a lot, and I watched him catch fish. Um, one of the last times I ever saw him at Homosassi was on a boat by himself, and uh, no guide, no nothing. And he caught, landed, and boated about 175-pound fish. Mm -hmm. um, and I never, I knew, I knew Billy. I didn't, I never fished with him, but I fished beside him multiple times. But I felt like Billy was on the edge of, he wanted to catch him so bad, he wouldn't catch him. Yeah, because these long eight-hour battles were pretty consistent with Billy. Right, and that's what I always felt. He wanted it so bad, he was afraid that he was going to break him off. My opinion, and that's sort of what I got from Stu, 
let's catch him. If we break him off, let's go catch another one. Right. You know, let's not waste a whole day trying to catch one fish. Right. But I've been guilty of that too. I've fished uh, one of my best clients all these years, Robert Bobo Cunningham. We fished six and eight, and what a lesson that was. We went through a an evolution, I should say, of learning what to do and what not to do with these fish. Because just like you were saying, some of the eight-hour battles, I mean, we had a fish on um, eight that would have definitely done the deal. Eight hours and 20 minutes. Number one, it hurts to be on a boat that long trying to hold on. But secondly, going back to the point about pulling on them, we look up a fish and it seems like all these fish want to go west offshore. No, I'd say 90% of them. And like I said, you see that tail, he's swimming. That's all he's doing, going offshore. He knows something wrong, and he's leaving. So in the days that we did this in Carabelle, six-pound test, eight-pound test, we'd follow him around. And finally, we said, you know what? We've got to do something different. And it goes back to the point of not wanting to pull on him, afraid of breaking him off. But if you're fishing eight, as you well know, because you fish six of them, or eight. Six, yeah. Six, yeah. So you can pull five pounds. So you're fishing eight, you've got to pull. So when those fish took off to the west, we had to say, okay, we're going to hold this fish, put maximum pressure on him until he turns and heads east to the hill. At that point in time, we'd let him swim. Because you can't catch him in six foot, eight foot, ten foot of water. I mean, we were 13 miles offshore with this one fish. Too deep, 15 feet, got dark, and I said, Baba, we got to catch this thing. So I said, I'm not fishing after dark. So we pulled it up, and I made a swing at it with a gaff, hit him, slid down, fish was on. He pulled back, get him up, broke. But back to what I was saying. You put maximum pressure on these, on these fish. They go inshore, and then you've got a chance. Right. What do you think about uh, these guys like uh, Thane Morgan and Dustin Huff that fought the six pound for like 14 hours, hooked it one afternoon and caught it mid mid morning the next day? That's a tough. That's a tough deal, man. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean, you Thane, can only pull so hard though on on four yeah, and six and yeah. four, and that was on four pound. Right. It caught an 88 on four and it over tested, so it was a new six pound record right, beating right. beating uh, Stu Apps. Yeah. Um, and Thane was chewing tobacco. He was falling asleep. Right. <laughs> and, and Dustin had to go up there and put chewing tobacco in his mouth because he couldn't touch the rod. <laughs> exactly. You, know, you can only imagine what kind of pain they went through. Oh, I know. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the name Brian Tang. Oh, know? yeah, for sure. Yeah, we call him a little poon tang. Al's client um, just about for, I don't know, 20 years now. But, uh, you know, he and Tommy Locke were fishing back in the old days, and they hooked up the fish. I think four o'clock in the afternoon, same deal up the court, up, you know, head north, head south, head east, head west, all over. So they finally just about ran out of gas. And they, Tommy called Jimmy Weber in the middle of the night. He brings him out five gallons of gas so he can make it. And then Poontang sitting on the bow, you know, waiting for, he wanted, he wanted to see daylight to catch him, you know, fell asleep, broke him off after 13 hours and 20, <laughs> 13 hours and 20 minutes. I mean, Jeez. what a ride that was. What is it like to gaff one of these dinosaurs? Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, it's sort of like an e-ride in at Disney, it, especially if fish is green. I mean, it's going to hurt you more, you know, more than not. Uh, it's going to jerk you out of the boat. I've reached down and gaffed them too close and had them knock me in the face, just about knock me out. But uh, the 202, fortunately, I was a little leery of killing that fish. I knew he was a big fish. But, you know, the fish, we hook the fish up and he jumps, lunges, I should say, sort of comes out of the water and takes off. And when we got the thing up to the boat, after an hour and 50 minutes, I said, ooh, we need this thing in the boat. So he was done. I could put my hands on him, so we lip capped him, and I wanted to tape him before I killed him. Right. Well, we'll get into that world record here in yeah. a little bit because uh, there's a big story uh, there that that needs to be, you know, built from the beginning um, with all the players, et cetera. Um, was it hard breaking into this game? 
Because it's almost like uh, it's such a protective sanctuary with all the, the previous guys, anglers, um, people who fished out there, Bobby era. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, Steve Huff and Fluger era, uh, Malzone, the list goes on and yeah, on, yeah. on and on the guys before them. Is it a pretty tight fraternity of guys? When but I, yet, off the water, you're close, and on the water, it's like, you got to beat that guy? Was that sort of a competition thing in well, any way? Well, when I first became involved in it, I was the new kid on block. And just like one of Al's and Tom's favorite sayings, a bean picker, you know. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. And I, it was evident, you know. So, I mean, there were many mornings I'd come out of the Homosassa River. Al would come by me, throw a rooster tail, drown my boat, you know. Al would? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> really yeah i was just he didn't a, want you around oh most of those guys didn't uh you know um i remember hewlett and cecil keith and you know nat and all those guys i was you know at that when i started we were all ramping out of the trade winds and everybody's you know had the little 500 hundred dollar a month trailers or box houses and all that and all our boats were lined up in a slip and uh so that's how i got involved in it but over time they realized I think we'd seen, they had seen too much of it. The people that just come in, fish for a while and go, and they screw up the fishery. They didn't know what they were doing. They violated the the rules of the fleet. Um, so it took a while to break into them. What are those rules of the fleet? Um, I think it's just courtesy, you know, uh, not infringing on the rights of the people that are there. If you've got somebody out there and they're, you know they're working fish leave them alone you know don't don't zoom in on them and that's what was that's what was happening to these guys by so many people they'd be out there fishing and somebody and they're casting to and and, and what i would and what i said they're not fishing for fish they're fishing for boats right they'd see boats they go to the boats they'd see somebody working a school they come in cut them off and so th- those were some of the rules. Right. I remember the last time I fished here, I counted 63 skiffs on the water. Yep. And that happened right after... Uh, like 88, 89, when I got out of there. Yeah. That happened right after the 3M... Uh, movie came out. With Billy The Fate. Challenge of Big Tarpon. Right. A world record or whatever. Yeah. yeah. What did the, the fleet think about that, that video? Uh, the guys that were serious about it hated it because it went from a, a nice small population of guides to a a circus. It was. It yeah. was a circus. Uh, but I think it's the same thing that uh, a River Run Through It did for trout fishing. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's become such a celebrated fish. Um, you know, the early years, I think the first guys who really put um, tarpon fishing on the map, if you will, was the movie Tarpon that came out in 1974. Not very many people did it. And they're, <laughs> right. re, they're, they, they're reshooting another current day version right. uh, in retrospect yeah. of that. Uh, when you first heard of tarpon, what were you doing in your life? Were you a fisherman? I was, I fished. I mean, I grew up hunting and fishing my whole life. But I had become involved in a fly fishing club in Gainesville, Florida, North Florida Fly Fishers. And I'd, I'd fished for redfish. You know, I got my beginning on with fly rod and, of course, trout streams. Um, but what I was doing, I was working. I'd left corporate business. I'd left Georgia Pacific, and I'd started woodworking. And I, I love building custom furniture and cabinets and all that stuff. So I was doing that, and I got involved in this fly fishing club. And a couple of guys said, man, you need to come out and, and uh, to Homosassa. And I said, well, where the hell's that? And they said, well, they got these fish down there, these tarpon. And I'd heard of a tarpon, but that's, that's when my life changed, <laughs> the day that I went to Homosassa. That was your first day ever uh, saltwater fishing for tarpon? For tarpon. You went to Homosassa. Yeah. That, and, and what did you see? Fish everywhere. Just, it was stupid. Who and, did you fish with? I fished by myself and, by a, and a buddy of mine. Yeah, yeah. So, did you have a skiff at the time? I did not. I had a John boat. Oh, you were out there in a John boat. Yeah. Wow. First time I went out there with a with a you know bow mount handheld trolling motor. Did you hook any? Oh hell no. <laughs> really? 
No. I, I, had, say, I had no idea what I was doing. Because those early years, I noticed that. And I asked Billy Pate this question. Do you remember when to get the tarp and to bite your fly? When the time changed between just showing the tarp and the, uh, the fly, when they'd be, bite it in almost anything, right. they'd just show it to them, they'd bite it. Oh, yeah. And feeding the fish. Right. And, and Billy goes, what do you mean feeding the fish? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, exactly. Well, then, when, I was, when I finally got in a skiff and got set up properly and was, and was able to stay with the fish and work the fish and pole, uh, that's when I caught them. But it's like you said, you throw it out there, strip, you're hooked up. I know. It was amazing. Not today, no way. You got to feed them. Do you remember that transition? I do. I do. It when was, did that happen? It, I'd say early 90s. Uh, they, you know, after the, the, the convulging, converging. Uh, the pressure. The pressure from the Billy Pate tapes. And I like Billy. But that, yeah. that video really send it into a tailspin mm -hmm. now when you realized that you started to having to feed the fish did you change flies did you did you bite tip it uh go down oh well when i first started i was using 100 120 pound shock it didn't matter i mean you could throw it out there and you were hooked up so yeah i went down to 80 um flies i didn't really change flies that i did make them smaller um but nowadays the flies have changed, the techniques, and and I tell all the guys I fish with, they'll want they'll see the fish and they'll get wound up. They want to cast, cast, cast. I said, no, man. Mm -mm. I said, if you can't see the fly and the fish's face at the same time, you're not fishing for these things because you have to read the fish. Mm -hmm. You cannot just throw it out. Uh, sure, once in a while, you can throw it out there and one's going to swim 10 feet away and just eat it. The problem, too, now, I think, is it's hard to get a fresh fish. It's got to go through a number of other boats to find that fresh fish, if I'm not mistaken. It, not unless you're first boat in line. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go further than that. If you go to, well, I've talked about Black Rock. There's a few of the guys from Homosassa that go to Black Rock in the mornings. You're not going to beat them there. If you do happen to beat them there, the next morning they're going to be 30 minutes earlier <laughs> they or, don't they take it very uh it's because their program is that they fish from six to two pretty much every day ramp ramp to ramp um my deal is i will go there and a lot of the guys i have don't want to do the dawn patrol because that's where the fish are up on top. They're rolling, you cast, it's deep, you can't see them. You hook up. It's an easy day. They want to see the fish. They want to feed the fish. They want to see them. It's like they want to hunt the fish. Yeah, they want to hunt the fish. But my gig is, will I go to Black Rock? Yeah, in the morning, sure I will. Will I go into the fleet? No. I try to find an edge, maybe off to the west, off to the south. But I'll tell you right now, and Al and I have talked about this a hundred times, let them have it. Mm -hmm. Let's go find them. one school of fresh fish. Yeah, that's key. Yeah. And that's the difference in the keys because all these fish are, are swimming down a line. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, the, 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 it's become a really incredibly high, highly in technical game now. It's just like the place, one of the places I dearly love, Lanark. Carabelle, when I first started fishing up there, had a buddy of mine say, you need to come up here. There was three or four of us. You could fish all day long. And there weren't that many spots, but you had to be, you had to move with the tide, depending on what it was doing. And after the word got out and the people came in, they were lined up there at daylight. There were no spots. Right. And same thing i mean so, we'd, we'd go to you know there were days out there we'd catch eight or ten fish and then it went from eight or ten to four or five to maybe one right because homosess if i remember correctly there were not at spots per se there no. were locations like yeah. in the keys you have edges and spots and right. points homosass is like a monster lake if i'm not mistaken it's huge uh, you know the oklahoma flats basically 24 square miles and 
we have spots to the south, Pine Island. We have spots to the west. We have spots to the north. We got the Black Rock. We got Chaz. We got all these places. We have the swamp. And even though that we've got all these spots and locations, the fish don't always go to all of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the problem. <clears throat> so for some reason, the fish won't congregate around one particular area. That's when it gets tough. Right. Hmm. And have you ever fished up in Apalachicola area? I have. Because yes. that's not too far away from here. No, I fished, uh, I never fished Apalachicola proper. Right. But I fished Lanark, Carabell, Alligator Point, Turkey Point, all that. Because there's big fish up there. How come these record guys don't fish up there? You know. Is it just so traditional, the, the home Sassa, the sound of, of that name? Well, no, I fished with Bobo up there for six and eight pound test. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, what I saw all the years I fished up there, there, I fished Homosassa in May and June, and I would go to Car- Carabell in July and August. And that was after the migration had already passed Homosassa, right. the northbound fish. So 90% of the fish that I saw up there were cookie cutters, 80 to 100 pounds. Right. And some of the guys that fished up there, they they'd all they were catching all these cookie cutters, and then they'd catch one that weighed 130 or 140. Oh, we got 200 pound fish. No. Right. And all the years I was ever up there, I never saw a fish even, even close to 200. Are them? Will it happen? Sure, but I never saw one. Right. What um, what tip are you fishing now? I mean, what? You've been doing this. You're 70 years old. Yes, sir. you got a pretty broken up body. Tell me about your body parts. <laughs> what's, what's broken? You know, I know your back. What's recently. not broken? <laughs> That's the easy thing to say. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I've played hard, you know. I've had back issue. I broke my back, blew a disc. I've had two knees replaced, shoulder rebuilt, wrist worked on, other other pieces and parts. But, uh, but I'm not ready to give up by any means. Of course. How did you hurt yourself doing all these things? I played hard. But, but you say play hard. How did you hurt your shoulder, for an example, your two knee replacements? You were not like a, a – you weren't playing football or downhill no, ski or anything no, like no. that. But, I, but I, when I grew up, I, I wrestled, played football. I okay. Had, I did some uh, backpacking, some mountain climbing, and <clears> busted up a leg on – you know, on, uh, coming down a mountain right just, just things just like being that. active yeah, just outdoors. being active um no one specific thing right um baba cunningham says you know he told me your greatest asset is twofold your toughness and tenaciousness which really could be the same <laughs> you're 70 right do you still have the fire in your belly today as you did in those earlier years absolutely absolutely there's no let up well, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I had the opportunity to elk hunt this year, and uh, it's not easy. Not at my age with busted up pieces and parts, but uh, after I got the elk, and I sent Bobo a picture, and he says, he says, I, I just don't understand how you can drag that broken up body of yours up and down <laughs> those mountains. But I, I just don't, I'm not going to give up. It's the will to win. Yeah. I want, I want to be able to keep active and... I feel like if I just stopped, I'd probably die. Yeah. What tip do you fish now? Depends on who I'm fishing with. I've got, uh, I'm still fishing eight with one guy. Uh, he's a newcomer. Um, and he's fished, he's, he's actually the guy that showed me Carabell in the day. Uh, but he's, he decided he wanted to try eight pounds. So we did last year. We're going to fish a few days this year. Um, Bobo fishes 16. Uh, most of my guys fish 20 or 16. But the best tippet available, tippet record, is the eight. 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 It's a no-brainer. It's a 127 half pound fish. I know. Everything else is in the 190s. Correct. Yeah, well, basically... The six is 143. I know. So basically, 12, 16, and 20, if you want that record, you got to catch a 200-pound fish. So I would, if I was a record chaser, that's the only rec- tip that you, could, you really should be throwing. That's, you can see that fish almost every, every day. day. Is, is there anyone throwing 20-pound in Homosassa? Sure, most of the guys. Is that right? Yeah, most of the guys throw 20. Yeah. 
because they just want to catch the they biggest fish ever. They just well, they just want to they just want to catch fish. There's nobody out there that's even contemplating uh, record fishing that that's properly set up. And I'm not saying they're not using what I consider proper IGFA tippet. I'm saying that they don't have a kill tag. They don't have a gap. They're not prepared. They're just fishing. They're just fishing. Oh, they, I got They you. love to fish. Mm -hmm. There's really, I can count on one hand, minus probably a finger or two, how many people are looking for a record today. Right. And um, I can see, I can see fishing 20. I would fish, I'd rather fish 20 then 16, 16, that record's a 191, 20's, you know, 202. Right. It's like if I'm going to catch a record in that category, why not break the 202? What would that do to your heart <laughs> if that was broken? Yeah, I say go for it. it, it I, it'd be great. Yeah. I, but there's nobody doing it, so that's why I keep saying I don't think it's possible. Bobo's fishing 16. He wants that record. Um, and his, Bobo's very analytical. And in his mind, out of those three tippets, that's the easiest one. I'm thinking too. Yeah. Out of 100, and, you know, is it 200 or 192? So, so that's why he fishes 16. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, um, we, and we fished eight and six. And I think Bobo is 76 now. And I, I just think he got tired. He has mentioned at time not too long ago that he would contemplate trying it again. But we learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, I'm not going to say we were pioneers when we started thinking about catching that stuff on six and eight, but, you know, it, it, it was a learning curve. Yeah. Did, did you call the 200 pound Holy Grail fish, did you call it Rocketta like Tom Evans did? I did, did not. No. You didn't? Uh -uh. Do you know the story about that? Oh, absolutely. About Rocketta. Is it true? Because he said, um, that when you see a double uh, prop scar uh -huh. from two motors, <laughs> right. he always thought it was the biggest fish swimming, you know, because yeah. the big fish are, are females. Right, right. So he always thought it was, uh, he called it Raketa with two tits dragging, <laughs> exactly. dragging across the sandbars. Yeah, Tom <laughs> is, to Raketa. Yeah, Tom has got uh, a way with words. <laughs> he? He's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, well, let's get back in now into, you know, that 202 world record. Um, the Hollings, uh, or yeah, Hollings, right. uh, Jim and Jim Jr. Jim right. Jr. caught that fish. Correct. The day before you guys caught that, Evans hooked a big fish. Monster. A monster. You guys were behind it. And uh, Jim Sr. took the most, the greatest tarpon photograph of all time. Right. That monster jumping out in front of that boat. Made, and Evans at that time was 230, 240, something like that. Dwarfed him. Yeah. yeah. It was crazy. What'd you think? Would you you're tell us uh, set that story up? That when I when I saw that, yeah, tell me about the day where you're pulling and what you saw and how they hooked that fish. Well, at that point in time, I was no longer a bean picker, so mm. so and and to this day, Al and I can fish 100 yards apart, 50 yards apart, and not bother each other. Do you usually chase each other and follow each other? No, no, and no, fish no. as a team. Uh, we have fished as a team, but over the years, we've learned it's better to split up. Right and. Hey, I got fish. I got fish. So if we can work together. Um, but that day we just happened to be close. And that week that the Hollands were there was a terrible week. You're talking about seeing no fish in home assassin. Weather too. Weather. Yeah. And it was cold. If you'll notice in that picture, Al's got on a pair of jeans and a jacket. And everybody says, well, the water temperature's got to be 74. I think the water temperature that day was probably 68. But the big fish were there. There weren't many, but they, they were starting to come in. So all I can remember is at, at any time Evans would get up off the bow of the boat and stand up, it's like something's getting ready to happen. There's fish. There's fish. Because if you've known him all these years, he's sitting down most of the time. And I know the, uh, the Iger spot in Homo Sassa, <laughs> the they spot. named it Iger because he was reading, he was reading the a book, book, the he, Iger he, Sanction. He, he, didn't, he didn't want to put the book down. Said, Wait, let me finish this paragraph. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Boom. So, yes, he sat down and Al would find the fish and said, right. Al, I, I mean, uh, Tom, I've got some fish. Get up, yeah. So, anyway, he gets up and I see this thing. I see him cast and all of a sudden this this giant. It's, it's a missile. A, it was a missile. And I don't, to this day, I don't know how that thing got out of the water, but it did. What do you think that fish may have weighed? 
it's like I say, they can weigh anything yeah. you want them to weigh until you put them on a scale. I, but I still, to this day, say somewhere 240, 250. That's what it looked like to me. It looks 300. <laughs> I know, but, but I'm, trying to be, I'm, yep, I, I'm trying to be conservative. I nobody wants to put numbers on a fish exactly. unless, unless you put them on a hook. But that fish was massive. It was just stupid big. Stupid big. And tell, tell us the story about that fish. The one that Tom and Al had yeah, on? Yeah, how that thing got away. Let's put it this way. I've heard rumors. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I can't answer that 100% honestly, to be honest with you. Because Tom tells me that he told Al, I think this could be a fish. Yeah. And Al says, I don't think it's that big yeah. or something. Uh, that's a pretty much what, how it what you out. heard. Al grabs the fish, takes the fly out. The fish jumps into his face, almost knocks him out. He right. drops the fish. Yeah. It sinks. They get the push pole, ride him, and he swims away. Yeah. That's the story. Was that, uh, so that's what you saw. Tell us about the next day when you actually caught the 202. Okay. Uh, the Holland team, they had fished pretty much all week, and I think we had hooked one fish. Let's back up a second. Stu Apt got you connected with the Hollands. They were fishing in the Keys a lot, and they wanted to fish Homosassa, and Apt told them to call you. Is that is that correct? That's how it worked. Um, uh at that time, I was fishing with Stu quite a bit on and off. Um, I got a call from the Hollands. He says, I got a couple guys that want to come to home Assassin and catch a world record. And I'm thinking, well, just about everybody wants to catch a world record. So I told him, I said, guys, I can't fish you. I don't have time when you're wanting to fish. And I hooked him up with a buddy of mine, uh, Ted Johnston, and who'd been fishing there for an awful long time. So they fished with Ted a couple of years. And then I just happened to have a break in my schedule, so we booked a week. And they came in, we want to catch a world record. And I said, okay, let's go. So like I said, the week sucked. There were no fish. Weather was sucked. And that morning, um, I can't remember what time. We didn't do an early dawn patrol, but we went to the south side of the channel, what we call the Chesapeake Channel. The Black Rock people, you know, the early morning home, home was Sassa guys, they get in there. And for some reason that morning, the fish had come into Black Rock heavy. So these fish were coming down the flat. And we were just south of the channel somewhere around the high rack. And the fish had gone through a progression of boats. I think Guido was up there, Al, several people, Ronnie Richards. And I look up and I say, oh, man, look at this water fish a big black purple knot coming at us so we had on um, the other guys throwing were they casting at these oh yeah fish? Oh, the, like i said these fish were coming through the gauntlet you can see them all casting yeah they were casting and i was behind them and we were fishing a little fly at that time called a lemon drop just a stew app style keys fly and we throw it out there and strip strip nothing happens and i said let's try a fly a different one well, the night before we fished, we're at the Poon Camp. And that was in Arapika. Al and Tom and I and a bunch of people were staying there. And Holland Jr. wanted to look or wanted me to teach him how to tie a fly with deer hair on it and stack. So I stacked it and spun it. And so I made this uh, crazy fly, um, grizzly sp splayed wings with a little marabou collar and did you fish this fly before or was this a new fly that you no i had fished these flies uh dalberg divers i told you i, I mm -hmm. think before i'd fished with larry dalberg so this is not a new fly for you you just showing them how to tie it this particular fly was definitely a new fly for me it oh. wasn't a it was a diver but it, it was a mess i mean it was just something that we wanted to it's just a random fly you tied it was up. grizz hackles a little bit of purple marabou some polar bear, spun deer hair, stacked deer hair. It was red and purple and black. So, how do you find these these colors and material? Are you just kind of just throwing it. stuff together. I wanted something black and purple, basically. Okay, all right. So anyway, I showed him how to spin deer hair, stack deer hair, and then he says, "Well, I want to. I want you to teach me how to tie a tippet." So take the fly. It's all tied up. Measure everything out. Show him how I, I do my deal. So we tied it. IGFA tip it and uh so back to the story 
we throw the lemon drop at the poon. Nope, nothing. So I said, well, let's do it. There was enough fish for us to let them go. So I took off with my troll motors and I went, made a big banana. Went south, went to the east, got back in front of them. And I said, okay, I said, here they come. And this a lead fish? I don't know. It, they were stacked across. It was a big knot. So no, it wasn't a lead fish. So uh, the fish jumps and sort of lunges. Maybe half his body sort of comes out of the water. And that was the last time I saw that fish for an hour and 50 minutes. We fish took off to the north and went through the Chaz Channel. And Ronnie Richards hollered at me, there's a giant bull shark out here. You guys need to be careful. So we're fighting the fish, fight the fish, clear the channel. We get up toward Black Rock, and here comes the shark. And he was a big guy, eight, ten foot long. So I, I told Holland, I says, we got to get up on the fish. So I, my big motor at that time was cranked up because we were following the fish. I ran it up right on top of the fish, put it in neutral, and just started revving the motor. And revving and revving and revving. And finally, the shark went away. And that was probably an hour and 20 minutes into the fight. I don't know. So <clears throat> in an hour and 50 minutes, the fish rolls by the boat, in front of the boat. Before that, it was up by Black Rock, deep water, 8 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet, who knows. And uh, I said, oh, man. I said, this thing is huge. So we get up to the fish. He lifts it up. And... I reached down, grabbed the, the shock, pull it up, stick the lip cap in it, and it was one of the Weber gaffs. I used to build them, and I pick it up, and it starts to bend. Hmm. And I said, oh. And usually, I'd grab those fish like that with that lip cap and just throw it in the boat. So I got this thing up here like this, and I said, whoa. And I got Holland Jr. I said, take the fly out. So we threw it up in the boat, and it was just massive fish everywhere. Tail at the bottom of the boat. By the, you know, by my seats, head up by the cockpit. So I said, well, we got to make a decision. So I got out my, at that point in time, we didn't have phones, we had calculator. We did have phones, cheap phones. But uh, I take out my calculator and I do the math, did the length times the girth squared, blah, blah, blah. What, what were those numbers? Do you remember um, how thick he was, <clears throat> the girth? 48 and a quarter. By? And I'm thinking 82. Anyway, I did the numbers and punched it in, and it came out 204 and change. Wow. And I'm thinking, nah, this ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> so I cleared everything out, and I did it again, 204 and change. So at that point in time, I said, boys, we're going to the hill. So I called Al, and at that point in time, all the, the fleet, the guys were somewhere around the short rack, probably – 30 boats or something. I called Al and I said, listen, I just taped one out at 202 or 204. He said, bullshit. I said, no. I said, I'm coming right through the middle of the fleet. I said, I don't have time to go offshore anywhere else. I'm going to the hill. So back to Stu App. Stu told me in the old days, he says, if you ever kill a fish for a record, he said, there's a couple things you need to do. He said, you know, they can puke up fish crap out parts and pieces so back to stew up i carried a kit I had a tampon plugged the vent i had rags the vent meaning oh because you didn't the gap it so so the the anus yeah yeah so you couldn't poop out correct and i stuck a rag down its throat and then i covered it i used to keep towels still do keep towels in the boat threw over the fish wet and, towels Correct. And as we went in, we'd stop a little bit, make sure he was wet. So we get back to the ramp, and <laughs> and, I, and by that time, Al had told everybody what was going on. And I stopped at Guido's truck, because he had an old dial scale certified. So I picked it up, and we went to the Poon Shack in Arapica. Yeah. We hang the thing up, and by that time, the Poon House had emptied. Everybody was there. It was uh, quite a party that night. <laughs> what was the celebration like? Um, everybody, um, 
eight percent of the people there were happy that it weighed 202. There was a couple that weren't so happy. A couple thought 20 pound test, you guys are cheating because that 20 pound test just had come into being, you know, a year or two before that. Right. Um, and then you want to mention any names? Do I? Yeah. No, who was who upset? Um, or, or suspect Billy paid, I bet would, be well, one. that was a whole other story. Uh, Dan Malzone, you know, he said, uh, the Guido said, you know, that's, that's bullshit. The fish doesn't count. It's on 20, blah, blah, blah. And I specifically remember Tom walking up to him saying, Hey, that's a great catch. Leave him alone. Uh, but so anyway, we weigh the fish. Take all the precautions. What did you first think when you saw that scale, you know, <laughs> bounce down at 2028? I was in shock. But I had already taped the fish at 204, and I'd used that formula before on other fish, and it was always close. So, But this is the reality. you got a fish yeah, on a hook now. Yeah, this is reality. Yeah, so it's the real deal. I mean, we were all ecstatic. And we photographed, documented, you know, did everything we needed to do. And then we took the fish over to Captain Jim Bradley's fish house and put it in the cooler. And uh, <clears throat> that was Holland's last day. And the next morning, well, that night, Bobo came in. So he was there to witness the whole thing. And I said, I got to get this fish, you know, to IGFA. Well, actually, I said, we're going to get it to the taxidermist. And... Uh, Bobo said, just go. I'll, I think Al had a day, so he fished with Al. So I took it down to the... Uh, King Sailfish months. Yep. Ran, you know, yeah. King Sailfish. And on the way in, I got a call from the IGFA, and they said, do you have the tippet? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, we'd like to see the fish. And I said, well, he's packed in the back of my pickup. Tarps and ice, you know. Do you remember who called from the IGFA? Jason Schwatweiser, maybe? No, I think this was before Jason was there. Glenda Kelly. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure that was her. She called and said, we'd like to take a, take a look at the fish. So I drive up in the IGFA and parking lot, and they empty out. And, and I can't remember the guy that was testing at that point in time. He said, well, do you have the tippet? And I said, yeah. And he was shaking like possum shit and peach seeds. He says, let me see it. Let me see it. <laughs> so he measures it, measures the shock, measures the class. He's gone. Okay. So the people that are listening, to measure an IGFA world record tippet, they break that tippet five, uh, five times and take the average breaking uh, point. That's correct. And if it's under the designated number, it's, a, it's an official record. Correct. And that was uh, 10 kg, or 20, we call it 20 pound test, but it was allowed to test up to 22 pounds. Right. And this one tested at 20.8 or something. I still have the spool. No, oh, can't throw it away. <laughs> yeah, of course not. <laughs> so then what happens? Um, well, they, I took the fish then to uh, Dougie, King Sailfish, dropped it off and uh, wrote him a check to start the mount. And then uh, went spent, spent the night with a buddy of mine. And the next morning, I think the very next morning, middle of the day, I got the call and said, it's official. So the IGFA processed it. They let it soak overnight, like right. they did. It's a done deal. With that, what I can't imagine the feeling. I was ecstatic. Your whole life was was out there on those flats, right? And you caught the holy grail. And and I'll be the first one to say, L U C K comes into factor, mm -hmm. but we were prepared. Right. I was prepared. The Hollands showed up to go fishing. I had the tag. I had the gap. I had the tippets and the flies and all that stuff but that's and i'll go back to Stu. he was so anal and that's why i was so anal in, in the way i tie i have a system so that's just that's how it happened but then everything kind of blew up <clears throat> yeah you know with the hollands right and this fish and you tell me about uh, the divorce if you will <laughs> all right so back to the poon camp okay we everybody we weigh the fish take it to the cooler and all that and i <clears throat> asked holland senior and at that point in time let me see at that point in time we we haven't uh, talked to anyone yet but i said you know i would like to i said i'm a fisherman and a buddy of mine mark emery is a great photographer and um, film guy 
he said, you should copyright the pictures, you know, try to make a couple bucks. So I said, okay. And I told Holland, I said, I want to copyright the pictures and I want to do a story. And I said, secondly, do you want the fish? No. I said, well, I'd like to have it mounted. And he says, well, have at it. Because the fish is basically both of yours fish. Correct. So anyway, but I said, I want to take the fish and have it mounted. He said, well, we'll get a reproduction made. And I said, oh, that's fine. But there is no fish that weighs two of two and a half in their little warehouse of pieces and parts. Yeah, right? you, want the, you want the fish. I want the fish. Yeah. And they said, have at it. Well, I took it down there. And like I said, paid Dougie to get it done. Right. Um, came back and Holland Jr. and I agreed to talk to Tim Tucker, who's now passed away, a journalist. And he did an article about how it all went down. And then Jim Jr. and I decided to wait and release the pictures and the story at a later time so I could have them copyrighted and all that. Well, I get a call after we find out it's actually a record. Of course, Holland's back in Washington by that time. Um, we get the call that it's a record. I get a call from the taxidermist that says, uh, we got a problem. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, Holland just called and said he's claiming this fish. And just a few days later, it was just you know, dump it in the ocean, do whatever you want with it. I don't, we'll get another mountain made or something. So that's how it started. Um, then he released some pictures before Junior and I had agreed to do it. So anyway, it just all went down. It was a spiraling to the toilet right. kind of deal. And I and, and Jim Junior, I think, didn't purposely do this. I think Holland Senior was um, the driving force behind it. Yeah. He was the one. Do you have you guys ever speak since then? No. Well, I talked to Jim yeah. uh, a couple of days ago. Okay. And he said he said uh after we sp we spoke, he said uh change the fishing uh trajectory changed his life in in a way. He said uh, the the record found me. It saved lives of other fish that could have been, you know, killed. Right. Uh, it's a record. Um, a record isn't controllable. It chews you or me <laughs> like a lottery ticket. Yeah. He said, the evening of celebration, Evans leaned over and said, you broke my heart, kid. Yeah. Um, but his final statement was, uh, one final thought came to mind uh, after we, he called. He texted me this. He said, I think uh, they were chasing a prize, a possession, coveting an object. That's fine by me to each their own. I was and still am traveling to wild outdoor places, chasing epic adventures and telling epic stories of the big ones that were lost and big ones landed. I certainly found that in 2001. I was fortunate enough to have and had enough experience and luck to tell a story with a happy ending. And I asked, I said, him, asked him too, I said, was there a divorce? He said, yes. But I wish Steve nothing but the best. Oh, I, I, I feel the same way about he Jim. He said, Jr. I really appreciate all he did. Yeah. Oh, well, I feel the same way about Junior. I think he was a great guy. Yeah. Well, um, that's your story. That's the home assassin story. That's the home assassin story, my man, for sure. You rang the bell. Yeah. You, you got the, the biggest fish ever caught on a fly. Who has that fly and tip it? Um, I have no idea. Well, the tip it, of course, it's been ruined. Um, it's at the IGFA. At the IGFA. What about I'm the fly? Sure. I'm sure it's still down there if they have it. I don't know. You know, there's a, a mount on the wall. I think it's stuck in your 202. Okay. They have it on display. Well, I knew that the last time I went down there for Evans's induction, the fish was still there and there was a fly and it was probably it. Right. But I thought they moved everything else out west to the Johnny Morse place. So it's Yeah, that's up in Springfield. Right. Um I don't remember I don't remember the fish up there, but I'll look at the yeah. induction ceremony when okay. you know, we head back up there. But uh I tied one to duplicate it and um uh, they and I did an article uh, I was featured in an article about the flies that caught the world record. So I tied one for those guys and it was published. So cool. Did it's, your life change at all after that world record no, endorsements? Not really. I mean, owner hooks, we used owner hooks. They, they were happy about it and they did some posters and sent me some hooks and all that stuff. But 
Yeah, it still doesn't even give me a cup of coffee free anymore. <laughs> so you didn't get any additional endorsements after that world record? No, not really. Yeah. I mean, I, sh I shouldn't say that. I've, I've been blessed to have manufacturers send rods and reels and stuff like that. But uh, but no, <clears throat> it's just, it, it's a world record. It happened 20, what's that now, 22 years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that was, uh, they talk about you being an old timer, old school. I'm gonna. We're gonna. Hardy's gonna send you one of our new rods. Sweet. Push you back in the current. The current ages. I hear you. I'm gonna put it in Bobo's hand. <laughs> you tell him that he's gotta. He's gotta come to the within the uh, the current state of affairs. You gotta get modern, huh? Yeah. Right. Anything you'd like to add to this great story? Uh, no, sir. But I do thank you for letting me share. I appreciate that very much. It's been an honor. Well, it's our pleasure, and it's a very important story. So well, thank thank you. Thank you, sir. Steve, yeah. great to meet you, buddy. Great yeah. to Thanks so you. much for coming on. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Yeah, man. Come for full circle. Yes. <laughs> from the first days that I was there in 88. Correct, well, sir. Well, great to, great to see you again, buddy. Good deal. When I saw it's best side story, when I saw it's just a word.